Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday, as well as upload the YouTube video version on Wednesdays as well, and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, today's case, you guys, is definitely one that is going to throw throw you through a loop. It was one of those cases that the more I kept digging, the more I kept researching, it was one thing after another, a domino effect of just my mind consistently being blown. It truly is a case unlike any we have ever done before. And without further ado, I'm going to jump right on into it today. So today's case starts with a woman named Barbara Bakeland. Barbara was born on September 28th, 1921 in Cambridge, Massachusetts to her parents, Nina and Frank Daly. Now, what we do know about Barbara's upbringing is that it was said that both of her parents had struggled from mental health issues. Barbara's mother, Nina, had a history of severe panic attacks leading up to Barbara being born. And not only that, in 1932, when Barbara was only 10 years old, her father, Frank, ended up committing suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning after locking himself himself in his car. Now, after Frank's death, Nina and Barbara decided to start fresh by moving away from their house. They ended up moving into a hotel located in New York City called the Delmonico Hotel. And the Delmonico is a very prestigious and popular hotel in New York. It has been the place where the Beatles met Bob Dylan for the first time. And not only that, Donald Trump actually bought the hotel in 2001 for $115 million and renamed it the Trump Park Avenue. So you may be familiar with it. So this was a very prominent spot to grow up. And when Barbara moved in, she had no shortage of the finer things in life. She lived a life of luxury once her and her mom moved into this hotel. And she really immersed herself in the New York lifestyle and all that came with it. It was said that Barbara was a very prominent socialite in Manhattan at the time, so just envision Gossip Girl. That's the best way that I can describe it to you. That was very similar to Barbara and her upbringing and what she was surrounded by growing up in that type of environment. It was a lot of parties. It was a lot of alcohol. There was a lot of drugs. And Barbara was exposed to a lot of that from a very young age. And people really knew Barbara partially because of how beautiful she was. Barbara was absolutely stunning. She also ended up being a pretty successful model, having publications in Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, and her dream was to end up in Hollywood. She wanted to be a big Hollywood movie star, and she spent a lot of time going to different, like I mentioned, elite New York parties and becoming very well-connected with a lot of other prominent and successful people in New York. Now, she was working on her acting career at one point in her life, and it was during this that she got introduced to a woman named Cornelia Bakeland. And Cornelia Bakeland and Barbara became very, very good friends. They became very close. And Cornelia decided to introduce Barbara to her brother, a man named Brooks Bakeland. Now, Brooks and Barbara hit things off immediately. They had a lot in common, and both of them really flourished in this luxury, lavish lifestyle that they were living in. And Brooks was actually the grandson of a man named Leo Bakeland, who was actually the inventor of Bakelite, which is one of the first ever plastic products. So it is safe to say that the Bakeland family was not short on cash by any means. So Barbara and Brooks spent a lot of time traveling all over the world, spending money on the finer things in life and really just enjoying this life together. However, not everything was as perfect as it seemed. Barbara and Brooks ended up getting married one year after they had met in 1944 at their wedding in California. And Barbara had actually lied to Brooks at the time. The reason that they got married was because Brooks was under the impression that Barbara was pregnant. The reason he was under that impression was because Barbara told him that she was pregnant, which actually turned out to not be true. And he found that out after they had gotten married. So Barbara had informed Brooks 
after they got married, after they tied the knot, that she had lied to him. And obviously, this was devastating for Brooks at the time. However, they continued on with their marriage. Now, Brooks would later go on to claim that even though Barbara was beautiful and successful, the main reason that they did get married was because he was under the impression that Barbara was pregnant. So when he heard that she wasn't, he truly felt like their marriage had already started off on the leg of manipulation. However, he decided to continue on with it because what Brooks knew about Barbara is that similar to her parents, Barbara also suffered from severe mental health stress struggles. She suffered from bouts of depression. She would constantly have explosive outbursts. And at the time, you have to remember the time period we're talking about, the 1940s, 1950s, you know, mental health was something that was not spoken about as widely and as openly. It was something that was very, very taboo at the time. And so many people, when they would be around Barbara, friends of hers, and they would see firsthand these quote unquote outbursts that she would have, It caused Barbara to lose a lot of people in her life, a lot of friends that she had because they didn't fully understand why she was acting the way that she was. They strictly thought that she was rude or they would call her a bitch. They didn't actually think that there could have been something deeper going on. Now, after the two of them got married, Barbara and Brooks, they ended up moving in to an apartment in New York on the Upper East Side, which is definitely one of the more prominent areas in the city. The two of them were known for hosting dinner parties, parties with celebrity guests like Tennessee Williams. But again, like I had mentioned, over time, Brooks and Barbara would go to lose a lot of the friends that they did have because of the way that Barbara was behaving and the way that she was acting. Now, this, along with a laundry list of other reasons, is to blame for why Barbara and Brooks's marriage was consistently on the rocks, and it did not help that the two of them both were constantly engaging in extramarital affairs. So as you can imagine, this was a very, very rocky relationship. And even though both Barbara and Brooks were having affairs of their own, the affairs definitely affected Barbara more than they affected Brooks. However, ultimately, Brooks and Barbara did end up having a child of their own. They had a son named Anthony Bakelin on August 29th, 1946. And similar to his parents, he did not have any shortage of the finer things in life. He grew up in a very lavish, luxurious lifestyle. He spent his time in New York. He also spent plenty of time in Europe because Barbara and Brooks had rented out different apartments in Paris and London and Italy, all before purchasing an apartment in Paris in the 1960s. And that really became their landing spot for a while. Now, similarly to New York, the parties did not stop. They were consistently having people over at this apartment in Paris, and it was actually at one of these parties that Brooks ended up meeting a daughter of an English diplomat, and the two of them started having an affair. Now, this daughter was 15 years younger than Brooks, and when Barbara found out about this affair, it absolutely destroyed her. Brooks had actually asked Barbara for a divorce at this point. However, Barbara responded by attempting to commit suicide. So Brooks decided to hold off on the divorce and continue on with the marriage. And he also ended the affair that he was having with the younger English diplomat's daughter. Now, after spending some time in Paris, the Bakelin family ended up packing up their things and moving to Switzerland and Spain in 1967. So they were going back and forth between Switzerland and Spain. And it was also at this time that Antony, who again, at this point was 20 years old, Antony ended up meeting a guy named Jake Cooper. Now, Jake was from Australia and him and Antony met while they were in Spain. And Jake really introduced Antony Antony to a whole new world. And Jake and Antony would also experiment with different hallucinogenic drugs. And again, they were just forming a very solid relationship. Now, Jake was bisexual. And at this point, up until this point, everyone in Antony's family had assumed that he was heterosexual. They thought he was straight. They had no reason to believe otherwise. And you also have to remember, again, with this time period, being gay, being bisexual, these were things that were not as widely accepted or talked about even 
as they were now. Everything was very, very taboo. And so this idea that Jake and Anthony could possibly be having a relationship together really didn't even cross Brooks and Barbara's mind because they were so dead set on thinking that Anthony was straight. That was until Barbara heard through a friend of hers that Jake and Antony had been forming a romantic relationship. It's unclear how exactly she got that information. However, she did inform Barbara that Jake and Antony were having a romantic relationship and that it was not a just friends type of deal. And the Bakelands, who were very, very worried about their image, they were very superficial. The idea that their son could possibly be gay or be bisexual was not something that they were willing to tolerate. And because of that, Barbara had left Switzerland and drove to Spain, which was actually a 16-hour drive, to personally pick Antony up. Because as I mentioned, they were spending time in Switzerland, they were spending time in Spain, but Antony was spending most of his time in Spain and his parents were spending most of their time in Switzerland. So when Barbara hears this, she loses it and she gets in her car and she drives to Spain and she picks up her son. Now they begin driving back to Switzerland, the 16-hour trek, and everything is going smoothly until they reach the French border and they realize that Antony did not have his passport. Whether that was purposeful or unpurposeful, we will never know. However, it resulted in both Barbara and Antony being arrested. However, they were released shortly afterwards and went back to Switzerland. Now, believe it or not, you guys, we are very near to the holiday season. I know, I really can't believe it either. And the holiday rush means more mailing and shipping for your business, but it doesn't have to mean more stress. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money for 25 years, and it can help you get ready for the holiday ramp up. All you need is Stamps.com's premium rates for all of your postage needs. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer, they even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. And taking care of orders on the go is even easier with the Stamps.com mobile app. Also, if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. With Stamps.com, you get your own personal post office wherever you are. You get huge carrier discounts from up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping option. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. So get your business ready for the holiday rush. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. Okay, guys, I wanted to let you know that Wondery's shocking true crime podcast over my dead body is back for a fourth season, Gone Hunting. The newest season covers the story of Mike Williams. It was Mike's sixth wedding anniversary when he set off on a hunting trip into the gator-infested swamps of North Florida. He figured he'd be back in time to take his wife Denise out to celebrate, but he never came back. Friends and loved ones feared that Mike met his fate through bad luck in a group of hungry alligators, leaving his young family behind, except that's not what happened at all. And after 17 years, a kidnapping, and the uncovering of a secret love triangle, the truth would finally be revealed. Enjoy Over My Dead Body, Gone Hunting, on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcast. You can binge all episodes of Over My Dead Body early and ad-free on Wondery Plus. Get started with your free trial at wondery.com plus. So they go back to Switzerland, and the Bakelands are there for a while, they're spending time there, and then they decide to go back to Spain as a family. The three of them are now staying in Spain. I know they are moving at the speed of light at this point. They're going everywhere and it's a little confusing, but they were in Switzerland. Now they're back in Spain as a family. And Barbara spent a lot of her time trying to encourage Antony when they moved to Spain to engage in heterosexual relationships, to date girls. I think that she was definitely afraid that going back to Spain, Antony would rekindle with Jake or he would start up a relationship with a different man. And so she really tr did everything that she thought that she could to engage Antony with 
girls. She pushed this so hard that she ended up moving a classmate of Antony's into their home. This woman was named Sylvie, and Barbara was very pushy when it came to this relationship. However, it ultimately backfired on her because instead of Sylvie and Antony starting a relationship, Sylvie and Brooks ended up starting to have an affair instead. Now, again, this was not according to Barbara's plan. And when she found out about this in February of 1968, she attempted to commit suicide again when she had found out. Now, unlike the other times, the previous times when Barbara had attempted to end her life, Brooks did not stick around. He decided that enough was enough in the relationship and that he was checked out of the marriage and he wanted to be with Sylvie. So he filed for divorce. And as you can imagine, this led Barbara down a severe line of depression. And as for Brooks and Sylvie, the two of them did actually end up getting married and they had a son together. However, the relationship did not last and the two of them divorced as well before Brooks would go on to find his third wife. Shortly after the divorce, Barbara ended up meeting a man, a new man named Samuel Adams Green, who was an art curator, and the two of them started seeing each other. Now, Antony at the time was also very interested and passionate about art, so Barbara was very excited when she met Samuel Adams Green. She figured that this could be the perfect addition to her family and that it would be great for Antony to meet someone who was in a field that he himself was passionate about, and she thought it was going to be perfect. She thought everything was going to go great. That was until Samuel Adams Green told Barbara that he did not believe that Antony was artistically talented. This was obviously very upsetting for Barbara to hear, and it really started the domino effect of the problems that this relationship had. So after six short weeks, Samuel ended up breaking things off with Barbara. And as we know from previous examples, Barbara does not handle rejection well and she ended up really going into a spiral after this breakup you know after dealing with the divorce dealing with all of the cheating all of the affairs dealing with this this was really really hard for her she ended up walking through central park in the snow with nothing but a fur coat on she was barefoot she walked all the way across central park to samuel's apartment and demanded for him to let her inside so they can talk however ultimately the relationship did not last now let's get into antony and barbara for a second. And similar to his mom, Antony also had his fair share of mental health struggles. A psychiatrist actually diagnosed Antony with schizophrenia. However, Brooks refused to provide Antony with any support or with any help because he did not believe in psychiatrists or psychologists, and he refused to give that to his son. So Antony definitely had his own fair share of struggles, as did Barbara. Now, when the divorce finalized between Brooks and Barbara, Antony didn't continue spending a lot of time with his dad. His dad had gone off and married this other woman. They had a son together, and Antony spent a lot of his time with his mom. And as I mentioned earlier, Barbara had a especially difficult time accepting the fact that her son, Antony, may possibly be gay. This was something that she could not accept. She thought it was going to affect her image, and she tried to do anything and everything she could in her power to change it, quote unquote. And Barbara did this by consistently hiring sex workers to come over to the apartment to sleep with Antony, thinking that this would be able to change Antony's mind and thought that this would be able to make Antony suddenly realize that he was heterosexual all along. And not only that, she wasn't just hiring sex workers, she was also trying to convince some of her socialite friends to also sleep with her son, and she would tell her friends that she was, quote, trying to cure her son of his homosexuality, end quote. Now, obviously, this wasn't something that could or should ever be cured, so her attempts were unsuccessful, and that is when things really started to turn up a notch. This is when Barbara began telling her friends, quote, I could get Tony over his homosexuality if I just took him to bed, end quote. And Barbara would go on to do just 
that. It was said that in the early 1970s was when the incestuous relationship between Barbara and Antony began, and that is when Barbara began raping Antony. Now, it should be made very clear that there is no physical proof that Barbara and Antony ever slept together. There's no physical evidence to show that. However, these accusations started because Barbara was the one going around to her friends, telling them she was sleeping with her son. It changed from, I could do it if I got him to bed, to that she was actually now sleeping with him. So that is the story that she was telling people. And that is why to this day, it is said that Barbara and Antony were sleeping together. Now, whether you believe it or not, it does sure seem that there was definitely something going on in that household and the tensions were rising because in July of 1972, while Barbara and Antony were living in Chelsea, London together, Antony actually tried to throw Barbara into oncoming traffic. The reason that she was saved was because one of the friends that they were with that Barbara and Antony were with at the time, was able to reach out and grab Barbara before she got hit by a car. Now, Antony did get arrested for attempted murder. However, Barbara refused to press any charges against her son. And instead, Antony was sent to the Priory, which is a private psychiatric hospital. However, he was released soon after. After his release, Antony began seeing a psychiatrist on house visits, and when the psychiatrist would go to Barbara and Antony's apartment, the psychiatrist was so worried about Antony's state of being that he ended up telling Barbara that he believed that Antony was capable of murder. However, Barbara disregarded the warning. And that brings us to two weeks later, two weeks after that warning on November 17th, 1972. The day began with Barbara getting lunch with one of her friends named Missy. Missy was also at Barbara and Antony's apartment the day prior on the 16th of November for a dinner party. So there was a dinner party and then the following day there was a lunch. And at this dinner party, Antony was also in attendance and Missy claimed that she could tell that something was wrong with Antony. He seemed very out of it. He seemed disengaged. He did not seem like his normal self. And when they got to lunch the next day, Missy was planning on confronting Barbara about her observations the night before. However, all Barbara could spend her time doing was raving about her son, raving about how great he is. So because of that, Missy decided not to say anything. Now, later that day, when Barbara returned home, there was an argument that ensued between Antony and Barbara. The argument ensued because while Barbara was out at lunch, she received a phone call to the apartment from a friend of hers and Antony was the one to pick up an answer. Now on this phone call, the friend was trying to make plans with Barbara and Antony made the plans for his mom. He ended up making the meeting, the date, he set the appointment for the two of them to meet up. And when Barbara came home and Antony told her this, Barbara was enraged because this was not someone that she wanted to meet up with. This wasn't someone she wanted to see. So she was very upset that Antony did that without her her knowing about it. So that is why the argument ensued. Now, the argument did get pretty intense. Antony ended up hitting Barbara, and when he did that, she ran into the kitchen. Now, Antony followed behind her and picked up a sharp knife off of the dining room table. When he followed her into the kitchen and Barbara turned around, Antony stabbed her straight in the middle of her chest. Barbara immediately fell to the floor and began bleeding out, and Antony called an ambulance. However, by the time they got there, it was too late. When paramedics arrived, they found Barbara laying on the kitchen floor in a pool of her own blood, and they also found Antony sitting in his bedroom in the middle of ordering Chinese food takeout when they had arrived. Now, Antony did not seem to be in his right mind when he was arrested because when he was brought down to the station, he claimed that Barbara was killed by her mother, Nina, so Antony's grandmother, instead of himself. But for context, Nina was in her 80s and lived thousands of miles away, and she did not murder her daughter. So police knew that something wasn't fully right. 
Now, Antony was actually found not competent to stand trial by reason of insanity, so instead of going to prison, he was sent to Broadmoor Hospital to be institutionalized there. And weirdly, and weirdly enough, while he was in this institution, he ended up gaining a little bit of a following of supporters. People had heard of his story because the media blew this case up tremendously. And because of that, he had a lot of people that supported him. Now, even though Antony had murdered Barbara, one of the people that did support him as well was his grandmother, Nina. And because of that, when Antony was released from the hospital in July of 1980, he ended up going and staying with Nina. Now, the one person that was not happy about Antony's release was actually his father, Brooks. Now, Brooks claimed that while Antony was in the institution, he received several threatening letters from Antony claiming that he was going to murder Brooks and murder Sylvie and murder their child. And so because of that, he thought that Antony a thousand percent needed to remain in the institution so he did not agree with Antony's release however nevertheless Antony ended up moving in with Nina Antony and Nina lived in an apartment on the Upper East Side, and it was said that Antony spent his days playing loud heavy metal music and mumbling and mumbling satanic chants in front of a shrine that he had created of Barbara now, this brings us to July 27th of 1980, so very shortly within the same month after his release. At this point, Antony had actually only been living with Nina for six days, and Nina had around-the-clock care from a nurse named Lena Richards. Now, at approximately 9 a.m. on July 27th, Lena had arrived at the apartment, as she always did, and knocked on the door to be let in. However, Antony was the one who answered the door, and he said, quote, Lena, quick, get the ambulance. I've just stabbed my grandmother, end quote. When paramedics arrived on the scene, they discovered Nina screaming and Antony attempting to run out of the bedroom. Now, Antony looked at police and said, quote, she won't die. The knife won't come in. She keeps screaming. I can't understand it. So they walk in. They're hearing all of this screaming. Antony walks out. He looks at them and he says, I keep stabbing her. She won't die. She won't stop screaming. I can't understand what's happening. So obviously, they immediately arrest Antony. Now, Nina had been stabbed eight times and had multiple other injuries, including a fractured collarbone and fractured ribs. However, she survived. Now, when Antony was taken to the police station, he confessed to police that not only did he stab his grandmother, but he also wanted to have sex with her as well. And he claimed that he wanted to have sex with Nina just as he had had sex with Barbara. He claimed that the reason for the attack was because Nina had tried to stop him from using the phone and making a phone call. She had asked him not to do that, and it set Antony off. He claimed that he then took the phone and threw it at Nina and hit her in the head with it. And once he realized that he had hurt her, he thought that he should put her out of her misery. And that is when he began stabbing her. It was at this time that Antony was charged with attempted murder because, like I said, miraculously, Nina survived the attack. Now, it was said that while in prison, Antony had multiple relationships with different prisoners and prison guards, even. When the prisoners heard that Antony had a trust fund and came from a wealthy family, it definitely heightened people's interest in him. Antony was supposed to start trial in spring of 1981. However, on March 20th of 1981, he was told in this preliminary hearing that the trial would have to be delayed a few months because they didn't have all the proper documentation that they needed. This definitely upset Anthony, and after he returned to his cell that day, only about a half hour later would he be found dead 
in his jail cell at 3.30 p.m. on March 20th, 1981, after being suffocated by a plastic bag. Now, his manner of death was ruled a suicide. However, Brooks is convinced that Antony's death was actually a murder. Now, again, with the news that Antony had just received about his trial date being pushed back, he had also been denied bail shortly at that time as well. The medical experts believe that everything had snowballed for him and he just decided to end his life. So that, you guys, is the case of Barbara Bakelin, Anthony Bakelin, Nina Bakelin, and Brooks Bakelin. And I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. Again, it is a wild, crazy case. To me, this is a very conflicting case in terms of emotion because you see someone like Barbara who gets stabbed by her son and murdered. However, you then think about all of the things that Barbara had done, you know, having sex with her son allegedly and pushing all of these sex workers and her friends onto Antony to try and cure him of being gay. And then you see his sweet grandmother who had taken him in out of the kindness of her heart and she is killed but then you think of all of the pain that Antony has been suffering through his whole life living in a family that was so purely based on their image you know this is just a sad story all the way around nothing in nothing and no part in this case is justified at all the murders none of it is justifiable it is just a very very sad case and i'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it so with that being said you guys that is all for me today thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of killer instinct again if you're new here hi my name is savannah and i'm your host of killer instinct make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.